Welcome to Juice. I'm Emily Harmon. I'm Gwen Douglas. And today we're welcoming back... Tor Goodmanson. Welcome back. Thank you. We're happy to have you again. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here again. And today it's a little bit different because you have bought a selection of wine. So we're in your hands today. So what have you bought for us to try? Right. So today we're, we're going to be drinking four South African wines. One is some, some bubbles, pretty good bubbles. And then three representatives of this really exciting generation of winemakers centered around the Svartland. Two Chonas, very different Chonas, and a pure Sasso. Cool. So let's start with some bubbles. Sounds amazing. We love a bit of fizz. We do love a bit of fizz. So this is a 100% Chardonnay from the Robeson wine producing region, which is slightly inland in in South Africa and quite a warm climate. It's also, I think, where Graham Beck, which is a best known sort of uh, producer of South African bubbles, sources most of their, their grape. But it's uh, it's made by a guy called Hank van Niekerk, but the wine is actually called Paul René, to give it that sort of little French touch. <laughs> so the full name of the wine? Paul René, MCC, uh, for Méthode Cap Classique. MCC, non-vintage? It is a non-vintage. Okay. Absolutely. It, and it's a brut. So if I wanted to find this online, I'd write Paul René, MCC, and I'd find it. Absolutely. Oh, and so hang you... on a minute. The winemaker's name is? Hank van Niekerk. I love it. And it's Paul <laughs> René. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> Hank... make actually... it sound French. It sounds no, much more exotic. <laughs> Absolutely. And he... Uh, he played rugby for Saracens, actually, sort of, he spent one, I think one season, he said, as a winger there, and actually sort of played a twig in him in the final of the Middlesex oh. Sevens against the Barbarians in 1997, wow. where they lost. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, he's a, he's a good guy, generally, and him and his wife are behind this sort of, this project, and they, they do two wines, a Brut and a Rosé, and we've just started shipping the, uh, the Brut, because mm. I thought it was actually quite nice purple. So, Method Champenoise. Absolutely. Aging on the lead. So we're talking about 15 months on the lease. You know, in, in a lot of these places in, in South Africa, and if you go, if you look at some of the regions where they grow Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, you've got quite a lot of cooling influence from the sea and from mm-hmm. the winds because there is no landmass between, between that southern bit okay. there and the, and the south South Pole. But what do you think? Very nice. I, um, I quite like it. So it's brute, nice creaminess about it. The mousse is very delicate. It's got all those autolytic, yeasty uh, flavours that are there that are nice, but this citrusy freshness on the yeah, finish. But it's also not super acidic. I think it's an easier session probably because your stomach's probably not going to be as like upset. And I guess that's where the climate rounder. comes in as yeah, well. Yeah, I was going to say little, the fruit is yeah, a bit rounder. It's riper that's fruit. I mean. and, yeah. 2015, Paul René, MCC brute. Food pairing. Hmm. I mean, I think because it's a little rounder, I'd probably... Yeah, I like. I love this with some creamy cheese. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, like, absolutely. Like, Could do cheese. with that. You know, oysters or some, um, you know, sort of prawns or shellfish that's got a little bit of sweetness yeah. in it. Yeah, agreed. Prawns for sure. Yeah, some grilled prawns would yeah. be lovely. Because Just grilled prawns little... with a bit of salt on. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. very nice. Yeah, but I think something mm-hmm. not always the what you would put necessarily a champagne or things mm-hmm. that are a little higher. Acidity. I think this is more interesting. Like you say. But uh, you it's know, but as you pointed sweets. out earlier, something you could easily drink ju- as a, as an aperitif so. wine. And you know, it's true that so, you know some of them can be. You don't. You only want one glass actually because after a while yeah. the acidity gets yes. you. But this, in this one, you don't. Uh, you're not. You're not going to have that problem. I think you know, good session wine. Then we could say good session wine. Absolutely. Got some stuff to talk about. Get a bottle of it. There's quite a lot going on with the label, right? Because the label is quite. <laughs> Classic, and then there's all these different stickers on. So that is that awards that it's got on there, then? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's, I mean, with us, it's the, the the stickers. I guess a lot of producers actually quite like them. If for us, it just means that the most junior member of the staff has to spend a lot of time peeling them off because we don't <laughs> like stickers at the wine rooms. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have like an implement that you use for scraping stickers? Or yeah, like finger, the fingernails. Just a fingernail. Oh. So everybody's like frantically filing down their nails before work because they do don't it. have to do that job. Not on sticker duty. But, but you um, actually peel them off beforehand. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough because it makes it look a bit cheap. It does. It does it's a bit tacky. It's a bit Dan Murphy's. Dan Murphy's is like a chain of, of bottle shops or um, wine, wine and spirit shop in Australia. What I'm interested about here is I can see this one sticker and it says SA Women's Wine and Spirits Awards. Little drawing of like a woman. Well, that's why yeah. it's a good session wine. If you've got things to talk to your girlfriends about, get a bottle of this. 
Not going to get gut rot from that. <laughs> gut rot? <laughs> you know, it means... We uh, are only promoting non-gut rot wines. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting that, you know, there should just be that... That panel should have set itself up so, as, yeah. say, women judging so, wines. So it's just women judging wines. Not, I think power to them. Why do women need a separate category I know, for it's judging? So annoying. I mean, they do this in tattooing a lot because they'll have, like, women's conventions. And as much as I understand that women need a platform for some things, it's also having those things sometimes keeps us too separate. Well, we have to have like our own special little club on the yeah. side. World's 50 Best Restaurants on all. And then they do female... Female yeah, chef, what, we need it. a separate category because no. we're not good enough to compete with the men? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, you know, I see your point, but I think... Yeah, in... I'd like to challenge any man that thinks he can do his job better than I can. <laughs> so if no, that's, like a, that's a good point. But <laughs> We'd love to meet you. The <laughs> yeah. food industry and the wine industry is still sort of massively male dominated sure. yeah I understand. so you can see why people try they're and pushing back the, yeah, yeah absolutely british icelanders sort of won awards <laughs> Yes. My category. Yes. Like, that's <laughs> definitely a niche. Yeah, definitely <laughs> You're carving niche. your yeah. own niche there. Wine rooms ratings is put a sticker over all of these stickers with drink this on a Thursday. Yeah, but I don't, I don't like scores. Hey, okay, not a score, but yeah. this wine is for brunch. You've got like, are you sad? Booze with your eggs. That's what you're having. <laughs> Booze with your eggs. Lonely hearts. <laughs> Lonely hearts wine. Have you had a bad day of work? <laughs> Boss messing, messing with you. <laughs> in desperate wine. need of a holiday. Yeah. yeah, different wines for different things. In need of a bit of pleasure. Yeah. That's from Ina. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> For any occasion. Yeah, really lovely. I like that a lot, actually. But this Very one is, a, one. you know, this one is a bit of an outlier because he's, um, you know, ideally I wanted to uh, bring a pet map from Craig Hawkins, who's another of our sort of great friends and yeah. who has been a very much a sort of pioneer in the natural wine movement in um, in South Africa. But unfortunately, his wines are too popular that they've sold out and we're waiting for the new vintage. Oh, exactly. I checked in Germany oh, right. and Tor was waiting for the wines to arrive in London. They didn't arrive yeah. in time. No. But so that will be maybe another... You know, another topic to explore at some stage. But this brings us on to the to the Swartland. And, and it's, you know, the Swartland is just a really exciting area, actually, because it's a bit like the, I guess, the, the Roussillon was in France a while ago. Yeah. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't highly prized as a wine growing area. And so it meant that, you know, a lot of pioneers were able to go in there on, I was going to say on a budget, but, you but know. They could do whatever they wanted. They maybe. could do what they wanted more. And, you know, they would not necessarily have enjoyed this, the the constraints of being in a more traditional area. So it meant that, you know, people like sort of Eben Sadi, Adi Badenhorst and so on, who are already now to the, you know, the, they're the older generation, sort of moved in there and sort of, and in their wake, this um, really exciting sort of generation of winemakers, probably sort of sort of inspired by Craig Hawkins as well, has, has really taken hold there. And so we're looking at three wines here. The first one is, it's going to be a straight Chenin Blanc. Oh, great. See, when I think of South African white wine, Chenin Blanc is the go-to grape because it's very much at home there in the same way that it is in the Loire. If you think of this yeah. grape variety, you think Loire Valley and I think or South, South Africa. Africa. Yeah, totally. yeah. Yeah. Possibly questionable exactly how long it has been there. Okay. Um, because I think the, the first Dutch or French got there it was probably more something like uh, Muscat that they were bringing along. Okay. Um, but it's been there for a while. Yep. It used to be known as Steen, as in stone. Yeah. In um, in Afrikaans and the in the Paderberg, which is this mountain, Hang the southern edge of the. Took me a minute. Yeah. The grape variety was known as st Steen. Steen. Steen is the local yeah. word for it. Yeah. Sanso was called Hermitage there. Hilarious. Yeah. Hence right. Pinotage, which is a cross between right. Pinot Noir and um, Sanso. And Sanso. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Absolutely. Geography. It's a granite mountain at the southern edge of the the Swartland. Mm -hmm. So granite and decomposed granite. So basically, you know, sand from granite. Yeah. Um, it's and it seems to have a particular affinity for Chenin Blanc. Okay. You know, it produced some of the greatest Chenin Blancs I think anywhere in the in the world. And you can have arguments about whether you know whether the, whether the Loire is better or other, other. There's you know there's different terroirs, right. but this is definitely a very interesting terroir. It's still in its infancy over there, but I think it's definitely the place where you're going to see some you know single vineyards, some real sort of crews being Ooh. sort of labelled there. So the first one. How do you say that? Sverva. Sverva. So you say it almost like German because it's like swear word. Yeah, Sverver. exactly. Sverver. W's are V's and V's are F's, yeah. basically. Sverva. Yeah. Um, so Sverva is a wanderer. Okay. Um, and some of it is the, the philosophy because behind some of those guys who actually they were part of the sort of post-apartheid generation. So they had the freedom to go and travel to without sort of yeah. 
excessive visa restrictions and sort of learn from various places. So these are guys have all, you know, they've all done sort of uh, vintages with Tom Lobo at Matassa, who we mentioned in a previous sort of podcast. Yeah. And Tom used to farm on the at the observatory on, on the Paderberg before okay. he got married and moved to France. Jasper was Adi Badenhorst's winemaker or assistant winemaker. Mm-hmm. He still kind of is, but is sort of he's now established his own cellar. This is just to give you the context, Gwen. So you know that Chenin Blanc secateurs mm-hmm. that you have. Yes. A A Badenhorst. That's uh-huh. who Tor is talking about now. Yeah. Gotcha. Adi Badenhorst is yeah. one of the the, the, the figures of the uh, the Svartland. Who's uh, making a larger volume of wine, but they're bloody good and yeah. really good prices. Absolutely. Yeah. Ridiculous value yeah. for money. Absolutely. No, no, it's really, really good. So this is Sverver. <laughs> Chenin Blanc 2017. 2017, absolutely. So Jasper was one of the... Um, he's been very lucky, actually, in the sense that he's done this sort of Burgundian thing. And mm-hmm. his, uh, his wife, who is Ardi's sort of neighbour, actually owns a farm and farms her grapes. So Francisca is a you know, cool sort of <laughs> farmer. And um, people you know, fight to, to buy her grapes. Um, and Jasper says, well, you know, he still has to pay the same price as everybody else, <laughs> but at least he gets first dibs on the, on the grapes. <laughs> The yeah the farm is called uh, Vattafall. It's just the it's the southernmost sort of valley on the mm-hmm. on the Paderberg. Really beautiful place, worth a visit. Let the wine do the talking. Yeah, cool. I'm really interested. I'm Thank you. So quite a warm vintage. You know, it's one of the real sort of drought years, which you know 2018 still will be, but at least in, they did get some rain in the second half of 2018. So 2019 will you know, well it takes the grapes some some time to recover from the drought shock from stress grapes. Mm. I mean, this is still pretty good. I mean, look, I think the stress is also helpful sometimes yeah. for vineyard. I mean, initially when you first open it, there's a touch of reduction on the nose. So there's that yep. little bit of them. Um, and for those who don't know what reduction is or how you can smell it, there's that little bit of this sort of struck mat. Whole bunch uh, was fermented in old oak, basket press, and then mm. 10 months of further aging before. Bottle. That is a hell of a wine on the palate. Really enjoy the roundness, the creaminess, but this freshness and almost this, this spiciness on the finish is mm. really nice. What do you think of this, Gwen? Yeah, I think the the nose didn't give it away, so it was a little bit of a surprise, actually, to taste it. I'd almost carafe it initially, this wine, yeah. I'd just chuck yes. it in a decanter. So yeah. I said washed butter, which sounded weird. Yeah, I, look, I frowned at it, so I said, what the hell is washed butter, and who is washing so it, and why think, are you washing it? What, what are you washing it with? It's like, <laughs> when you're making butter, is that like... The moment where you're taking those fats and swishing them around in water, and for some reason that popped into my okay. head. Like fresh yeah. fresh butter. So yeah. in creaminess, okay. I was thinking dairy, like fresh butter as you're making it. So I was thinking about you with your hands in the sink, with a sink full of fairy liquid, <laughs> scrubbing your butter. <laughs> well, that sounds like a euphemism And I thought, else, she's but... bloody long. <laughs> Anyhow. Let's not go there. Okay, Delicious. yeah. <laughs> no, anyway, it was quite a s- surprise. Because I think the nose for me was dairy, yeah, some maybe minerality a little bit. Yeah, 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 you're no, getting definitely. this apple you're still getting the shinna sure. qualities, like this little bit of bruised apple, yeah, fresh apple, citrus. And quince and so yep, on. And definitely, but it's with definitely that. bigger yeah. and rounder also than the... Also, again, not a huge amount of acidity. Not massive. So I think without the acidity, which is sort of pretty high there, this wine would be would be flabby mm. because of the, the conditions of the vintage. But I think one of the beautiful things with which pretty much all of those guys who are, um, who are sort of making wines from grapes on the, on the Pondelberg have achieved, yeah. and the peak at the right time, you know, it's, it's a bloody hot area. Yes, so when absolutely. I was there for, you know, for Ryan and Sam's wedding on the, on the Saturday, it was, you know, it was 35 degrees, 37 degrees. You know, come the evening, you get that sort of wind, Cooler. that breeze coming from the ocean, and it can get cold very, very quickly. You're getting this build-up of sugar... Sure. Uh, in the daytime, and then you're letting the sort of acid levels or the what the plant rest in the so evening. So I'm going to yeah. contextualize what I said about the acidity not being high, and maybe that's also because I don't drink a lot of wines from the New World, yeah. which means I'm drinking a lot of European wines whose acidity levels are potentially sometimes too high. Yeah. So I yeah. think sometimes if I'm drinking something from somewhere else, like I don't drink South African wines super often. Yeah. For me, it's not high just relative to the other things I'm drinking. I kind but of I want to rip her a little bit because she drinks yeah. Gewürz from me, which has incredibly <laughs> low acidity. So sure. I feel she's, she's like being a bit of a hypocrite. No, but I think that like, you know, if I'm used to drinking Chenet, you drink it from the Loire, sometimes the acidity is like yeah. out of control. 
or it's actually true. makes it difficult to drink because the acidity is so high. Sure. So what yeah, you're I'm, kind of you're always dabbling in extremes, Gwen. I know, but I also <laughs> think that sometimes it's contextual. So me saying that it's that I think the acidity isn't high doesn't mean that it's not. It's, I think it's a very balanced wine. I think it's absolutely. very balanced. Yeah. So I think Definitely. for me, because I'm used to drinking wines that, whose acidities are much higher. Uh, yeah. With maybe seems, less texture. Right. Yeah. Seems less. So I just wanted to clarify that without being... Yeah. No, no, no. And so, I think it's a great wine. And sort of it's... Uh, it's delicious. It's all right. So, You're allowed to taste the next wine now. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll just go like sit in the corner and weep gently. And yes, Just but, smell, smell, smell the wine over and over again. Jasper doesn't buy the stickers, but Tim Akin gave it to 95, <laughs> which is... Uh, is that good? good? He doesn't... You know, his, his, uh, his report is quite, uh, quite a big piece of work and okay. quite an encyclopedic at the South African wine industry. So is that one of his areas of focus then? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. A question that you're itching to know the answer to or are wanting to answer. What <laughs> would you eat with this, Gwen? I actually would love this with a risotto, something creamy. That's a good call. Mushroom what? risotto yeah. with yeah. some prosciutto totally. melting over the top yes. of it. Roast. Sunday roast. Delicious. Yeah. Schmaltz. Goose fat potatoes. Just, yes. Ah. Schmaltz on toast. It's like Schmaltz. chicken fat. Chicken okay. fat on toast. Well, you know, but I think even bangers and mash. Yes. Bread, bread oh, wow. Mac and cheese. Mac and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Only if you were going to make the mac and cheese with something a little fancier than North American mac and cheese. You have to put a little bit of mustard little... in there. You put a bit of mustard in your mac and You'd cheese. Have to have and breadcrumbs on top. Oh, go on, push the boat out, some truffles. Yeah, oh, that's <laughs> oh my mac God. and cheese. Oh my God. And actually, anything like egg and truffle or yeah. tallarini truffle would be quite nice. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's always really nice to try new stuff, but that's actually not the case. It's really nice to try new stuff that actually tastes good. Yes, because okay. you try a lot of new stuff and then you're like, oh no. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, but absolutely. That's nice wine. But yeah. you know, the the nice. reason why we sort of focus on that bit of South Africa in particular, but in, on the new South Africa, and have started importing yeah. some wines from that, is because we think it's such at the moment the quality that you get for the price is unequal. No, it is. It's crazy, actually. Like I mean, that, we've gone we for dinner and we, we, we've wanted to keep the price down when we were in a group. Yeah, we were drinking we Molino, like even the Kloof Street range. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. We, when we've have been with groups of friends yeah. that are not that into wine, don't usually spend too much by the bottle. We're like, great, just send, you, just send that. We know stuff. it's safe. Everybody will like it. It's interesting enough for us, but yeah. it pleases everybody and we can drink a lot of it and not spend <laughs> that much money. Yeah, I think it's great. Which is brilliant. Yeah, so for those of you that want to drink quantity <laughs> with and quality, quality. <laughs> drink SA. Yeah. So this next one I'm, is very intriguing. It's a sheep's head. Sheep's head. So the... Yeah, the eye. The eyes are giving it away. It's not too crazy looking. So the story behind it is that the smiley is that. It's a sheep's head, half a sheep's head. And it's basically the, it's the cheapest cut of meat you can get there. Yeah. Um, it also happens it's to be the smiley. That's a smiley. You call it the smiley. Oh, you can awesome. see the teeth. Yeah. It also happens to be quite popular in uh, in Iceland and Norway because we have lots of sheep there. Um, <laughs> Everybody loves that little teeth bearing grin there. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. The, the reason for the name is that this would start wine started off as being made from the cutoffs ah. from the better wine. So we said, it. yeah, this is the this is a cheap cut. This is smiley. I love it already. But. Um, Emily has tried it. <laughs> I met Ryan and Sam in the summer in August. Thank you. Uh, actually, at wine rooms, Brackenby Wine Rooms, and um, got to taste a large amount of their wines. And I was really impressed. I'd only heard about the wines through tour before, and I hadn't had an opportunity to try them. And I was really impressed with all of the wines. And they're two very decent people. So it's Absolutely. also nice to meet good people making delicious wine. And Ryan is a. He's a fantastic geek in the sense that he is so geeky, but so enthusiastic. He loves his subject so much. And this is his wine that sort of, you know, he's ticking all the hipster boxes. Yeah, there's, a, there's a nod to the Jura, there's a nod to yes, uh, Sherry. Yeah, so the reason for that, though, is how this is made. So it's different absolutely. Chenin Blancs made um, in different methods. So there's one on the floor, isn't there? There's Chenin Blanc on the floor. Yeah. So there's some Chenin some with been, botrytis. Yes, some oh, has been Madeiraized. Yeah, Madeiraized. It's like a never-ending... So the full breakdown, so on the floor, <sighs> Madeiraized, oxidative. Yeah, uh, some of the, you know, the, the floor botrytis. one has... The, there's, a, there's a little element of, uh, of a Solera getting yep. in there now with yep. the various vintages. But it's, um, but it's a blend of four different vintages, essentially. Wow, you know, the wines will get more complex as he accumulates sure. more of his little cutoffs yeah, that he so wants to blend cool. into things. So the name of the wine is Non-Vintage Smiley, and the colour of the sheep's head changes, doesn't it, every bottling? With every one, absolutely. So this is V4. 
So they're fourth vintage of this one. So I have to say the smell is like unreal. Umami. Like, I'm in Umami, Japan yeah. with this wine. This no, wine must be amazingly in Japan. Everywhere. Yeah. It depends on like how you corner your brain to smell it. You can smell pineapple, you know, like overripe pineapple, and then you go suddenly like, boop, you're in a completely different direction. It's like taking You're right though, there is an exotic element, but there's also this yes, orchard the fruit that you always use shenim. Yep. You've still got the apple, the quince, everything. It's like the an The creaminess, oracle. the lactic, but the nuttiness. Yeah, it's really... The yeastiness, that nutty yeastiness from the floor. It's all there, and it's a really, mm. you know, in a really... Honey, caramel. A really nicely balanced package, actually. I think that's it. Um, and we... Fucking so we're, fucking good. We're now yeah, distributing... I knew you'd love this one. Yeah. Look at her. I'm really excited. That's it. It's a new... Why am I it's, is, it a, is it a new Gewurz Tramina? No, let's not get that crazy. <laughs> But this is very I, know, I love I love how serious her face changed for a second there, where she's like, did you just say that? No. I feel that this should come above every Gewürztraminer that you've no, ever no, tried. No, no, hang on. But Gewürztraminer is a great variety. Yeah. This is like, someone's, someone's created art. This is what that is. And that's a different thing. A phenomenal <laughs> idea. Yep. Yeah. And I think, is anyone else doing something like this? In this... Well, so I think that it's... Um, I think Ryan is the, was the first to push about that in that in those terms, yeah. but people are emulating the uh, the example that he's uh, that he started in South mm. Africa. Because this could be just a complete gimmick, but it tastes delicious. I kind of because there's that like little Jura oxidative thing. It makes me think of like old grains, like ancient grains, which makes me think of like bulgurs or wheat. So like a beef stew with bulgur or something like that could be interesting. But I think because it's pulling me in every direction, I think you could probably pair this with pretty much anything. With a lot of things, I think. Because I think, you know, you think, mentioned the Jura, easy. you could have it with some lovely yeah. old Conte. Yes. Uh, but at the same time, when, um, when Ben Wellin from Carte Blanche, who came to South Africa with me in June, and he's now distributing the wines in the UK, um, oh, Ryan and uh, Sam took us to Andochine, which is the Asian restaurant, the De L'Air Chaff wine estate which is very very posh in Stellenbosch mm. um, but it's a beautiful Asian restaurant and this wine with all sorts of Asian food yes totally sort of was amazing with like sort of uh, roast Korean pusa and things like that yes. well one Asian food definitely because there's enough acidity in the wine for I sure I could even also drink it with seafood like langoustine I know I heard you whisper that under your like... breath langoustine because <laughs> I think there's like enough mi minerality that it's like but it's some sweetness oh for sure yeah yeah, yeah absolutely like really mm. nice. I think you're getting some uh, you know there's there's lots of um, complex layers but I think in this one and, and in, in Jasper's one as well you're getting sort of finishing on some oyster shells and yeah. that kind of sort of there's some mm, real little... sort of saline notes for that super um, so the two wines are you know are interesting because they're different expressions of Chenin from the same place mm. This one is a bit more of a technical wine, more work, fair mm -hmm. enough. This is po possibly a purer expression of the terroir, but they're both sort of uh, very true to what the, the Paderberg produced. For me, this was a real revelation, this wine. And trying it again sort of concretes my initial experience of the yeah. wines the first time. I That's think why you were looking at me when I was trying it. <laughs> I know, because I, I was really excited for you to try this wine, because when I first tasted it, I was like... I don't know a wine that tastes like this. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think you first tasted the V3 with when you yeah. came and had a drink with me and Rich at the wine Yeah, we, but it was so, very quick, wasn't yeah, it? And yeah, I liked exactly. it. And, and that, yeah, it's true because I did a little Instagram post about it. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, this is really cool. And then um, very kindly was invited to lunch with the producers and, and got to know them and um, really, really like what they're doing wine wise. This is like a full package wine for me because also I love the label. I like everything about it. Yeah, it's the wine you would buy without tasting because they've yeah. actually put thought into the design it's of the cool. label. It's interesting, so it draws you in. There's no label like it. And then it like delivers on that cool factor that yeah. you bought it for. You go, wow, that's cool. And then you drink it, you're like, wow, that's really cool. So a friend of mine always says, um, you know, as soon as they see the wax top, they're like, I know, that's a sign of quality. And I'm like, that's absolutely <laughs> ludicrous. But actually, there is a logic behind it. Because okay. because Tell if us. you think, if you bought only wines with wax tops, nine times out of ten, they're smaller producers because producer. they're doing yeah. it by hand. Yeah. So the likelihood of you getting a better wine is a lot higher than just buying yeah. any old wine from the shop. So there is... A truth to it, even though I've tried a lot of wax top wines that are average, but in this circumstance, the wax top rule definitely applies. And in so fact, and wax tops can be really annoying when you're yes. opening them when they're too brittle. 
but luckily the um, yeah, the saffron quite... seem to put a lot more plastic into their wax or something. Oh, someone... So it's actually quite. Is it plastic or paraffin? Don't know, someone actually... t- but someone was saying you just have to like rub the top, really? rub it with your thumb for a What's couple this? minutes. So... When? I know. Where were you when somebody said just rub the top of it? <laughs> but actually, it works because if you soften the wax just enough, you don't get any. There's no uh-huh. crack. There's no dust. It yeah. actually comes out just in a. Boop. <laughs> That's an official term. Hashtag. <laughs> but it really works. Oh. So now I do it at home. I stop doing sort of the gestures, the please. Stop doing <laughs> the gestures. Well, next time I'm sort of faced with a bottle of France Lacuta, so I'll say, I'll, uh, Next I'll time you're mind. on a date and you're rubbing that wax on the top. Next time. <laughs> there was a commercial for like ketchup years ago, I think in like Sweden or Norway or something. But it was this uh, television commercial about like a young couple on a date. And you know, you don't see anything below the chest. And he's like, you know, it's just like a ketchup bottle. And then you don't see anything else, but you just hear... And he screams. And they're like, Heinz. <laughs> it's one of the greatest commercials ever made. I've not seen that, and I definitely need I to see I have a thing it. for old advertisements, but yeah. <laughs> sure it's on YouTube. It is definitely on YouTube. Because there's one more bottle, and you have it placed after this one. So it's a, it's a red, actually. And um, so the guy who makes it, the, you know, a man after your heart, I would think, sort of because he now gets his tattoo artist to, uh, to do all, all his wine labels. So I don't know if he did this one, but the current generation... Um, of wine labels are now all designed by his tattoo artist. So I'm going to make a little aside right here. Any winemakers looking for labels, please contact me. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to make some wine labels. So Tremaine was the winemaker for um, the Mullen News. Mm-hmm. Um, went independent about um, three years ago. Mm-hmm. I think so the first vintage of this that we sort of tasted, he'd actually uh, made in a uh, in a plastic tub and covered with cling really? film, basically. Amazing. It was that size of production. Punk uh, rock, so uh, it, f- it fits the label. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, a, it's just a, it's a, you know, I think it's a lovely, fresh expression of Sasso. And um, I mean, Sasso is a great, I don't know what you think, Emily, sort of, for example, but how much Sasso do you come across? No, I've, tra- I've tasted a few, but I, I, I was actually going to say the same thing to you, but... Um, I mean, Sanso is an interesting grape variety. It's quite a large grape um, with a thicker skin than Pinot, but still not the skin's not too thick. Um, and the, the plants produce quite a lot of fruit as well. So it's quite easy to have quite boring Sanso because they can yield quite a lot of fruit. But um, I find Sanso, when it's made well, a very, very interesting, alluring grape variety. For me, it's somewhere between French and Italian wine, in the way that there can be a little bit more structure and a little mm-hmm. bit more tannin and acidity than some other French varietals. And this aromatic profile, sometimes rosy floral notes that make it very, very charming yep. when made well. And that's what I like about it. So I think I'm always curious to try it. There's not enough good examples of the grape, but when made well, very, very enjoyable. That's my two cents on Sanso. Absolutely. And I think we should say sort of one of the unifying things amongst a lot of these sort of the wines that a lot of these um, Swarton producers are making is bush vines and old bush vines. So very low yielding wines, okay. uh, dryland sort of uh, no irrigation. The the grapes that uh, you know, yes, Sasso when it's overdone, when it's yielding a hundred hectares per per hectare, yeah, is watery boring, and boring. And bo- watering mm. and boring. Uh-huh. But this is you know more likely to be sort of twenty to twenty five or something like that. So you're getting that sort of extra sort of concentration. So a lot of fruit, not a lot of tannin, but it's a lovely wine. What I love about this, the wine's almost transparent. Yes, it's really you can see color. through it. It's lovely. Yeah. It's like um, it's like a pair of tights. Twenty Donia tights. Ooh, hello. <laughs> yeah, it's very, very clear. It appears a little bit like Pinot Noir in the glass. Yes. And I like it because there is this sort of savoury, almost chemically sort of back note, like this tarryness yep. to it, which makes it interesting. Yet it's very fruity. It's very yeah. There's a lot of you know fruit sweetness sort of coming through that. So it's actually quite a. I think it's actually quite an easy wine to to enjoy and actually. Um, and pure, not a great variety that should be dominated by oak at all. No. I think this is really a great variety where you want to fuck around with it as little as possible. For Absolutely. Lack of a better word. You don't want to mess around with it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it, you know, it doesn't do oak. The idea of an oaky sanso sounds horrific Just to me. Just wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Just wrong. It's criminal. It's, there's nothing worse <laughs> in the world than oaky sanso. 
So think, don't even think about it. Think it's, it's <laughs> Minority <one> of, <laughs> Report <laughs> was coming after you if you even think about Absolutely. it. Absolutely, just uh, no <laughs> thinking. Yeah. No, this is delicious. I also think I tasted this at Wine Rooms with you. You probably have, actually. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I remember the, the label. I would probably prefer to drink it a tiny bit colder than it is. But that's my taste for a light red. A little bit on a chill could be nice, yeah, mm. for sure. That's probably how I would... I don't think this is too this. warm, though. No, no. But I yeah. would say that my preference would be a little colder. Yeah. But that's perfect. Yeah, but there you go, sort of... Uh... Do you want an ice cube, mate? <laughs> <laughs> Because you're not getting one. Or, or fridge it overnight and have it with brunch tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Like That's that really too. nice. Those wines for me. Yep. For Renee, that would be a good go-to sparkling for me, where I think it's really well made. This would be a really nice introduction to South African wine for a lot of people, because it's not scary in any way, and I no. think it ticks a lot of boxes for the carver drinker, the champagne drinker. Great brunch wine, because it's rounder, easier. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, maybe for the carver drinker. Or a good Cremant. Um, mm -hmm. And then I think the other wines, for me, I almost feel they have a bit more personality, particularly the last two that we tried. I love that Smiley because it's such an oh, individual, singular wine. It's hard to decide my favourite, but I'd be somewhere between Smiley and this Sanso because I love the purity of the Sanso. It's delicate, but it's giving with its fruit and its flavour. Um, yeah, that would be where I'm at. And not because the first Chenin was I really like nice. the first Chenin. Yeah. So Gwen, a quick uh, recap, your, your foods for those three wines. So this is what I'm trying to figure out the foods for this Sanso because... I have to say, as a novice, don't know if I've ever had any single varietal sensor. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I actually don't know this grape that well. Mm. This is a very good starting point for you, Gwen, for the grape variety, I think. I think yeah. this really represents all of the positive things of that grape variety. Uh, yeah, it's very nice, very light. I'm going to ask you guys what you would eat with this, because I think this is... I have some ideas. But Grilled quail with pomegranate. Well, yeah, I've been thinking about that. I've been thinking about it for a while. So at Marito, right. Marito Hackney Road, they were doing these grilled quails with like pomegranate I mean, molasses pomegranate. and stuff. And I think that would be killer with this. Yeah, yeah. Like a light meat that's not too yeah. strongly flavoured. Very specific. Middle Eastern. <laughs> Middle Eastern <laughs> light meat grills. Yeah, chicken, totally. Middle Eastern chicken. Yeah, I think you know. I think with all these wines, also you've got to think of the the place and the fact yeah, that these guys warm, love their barbecues, yeah. their fries. Yes, yes, and yes, so yes. all of these wines would go really well with sort of bright, bright shellfish mm -hmm. or bright sort of meat, so that kind of thing. Um, because the only reason why I didn't say anything is because it was actually going to go back to a sort of in between two of the things that I'd said before, which I actually think again a mushrooms risotto or old grains or something sort of. Because there's this like umami ness about it, but also a lightness. So you don't want to like over kill it with something too heavy. Yeah. No, when we, uh, you know, when we go to see, when we go to see Jasper, for example, he sort of, you know, he'll drive us into the sort of vineyards and sort of suddenly he'll have set up a bride. Yeah. He's doing some blue wildebeest sort of in there to have with the wine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Brilliant. It's well, amazing. We, I mean, we'll talk about it after. I want to know what wine. <laughs> no, I want to do it on, I want to do it on, what is it? The fuck is a wildebeest? <laughs> What is it? Because I imagine something really crazy I when I hear that. I imagine a warthog. I imagine, I, yeah, you're right, Pumba from The Lion King. Pumba, <laughs> but Pumba. I was like, she said Pumba, and I went, I don't know what the fuck she's on He's about. He's a warthog. Then she said Lion King, and I went, okay. Yeah, Pumba, <laughs> gone wild though, like can wildebeest. It feels like yeah. bring back, what was it, pork enhancer? <laughs> But it's not a pork pool. booster. Pork booster. Pork booster and porkiness. So From the before. episode a couple of weeks ago, we would say pork booster. Pork booster. Pork yeah, so booster. wildebeest is like a. Is it I a think, pork booster? No, I think it's not a pork. I think it's more in the <laughs> antelope <laughs> family. I have to be honest. I did think it was somewhere between an antelope and a pumba. Shut your face! <laughs> <laughs> what are you even talking about? You know like, what I'm oh, talking about. Yeah, I knew but I, mean, I knew you were wrong, but I didn't yeah. uh, say anything. Oh, I, just, <laughs> I think it has. No, I think an antelope is also a bit Lion King, though, isn't it? Something. It would be something from the Lion. King. <laughs> Don't. Right now. It was one of the animals from the Lion King, is what we. have. <laughs> yeah, but I don't so think I'm it lying. was a lion. <laughs> I'm literally crying right now. It's really. 
So maybe your next theme should be eat your way through the Lion King or the Jungle, jungle Book or something. Yeah, or just like, <laughs> what is a wildebeest? Who knows? <laughs> Who can let us know? Who can let us know? Someone what does a wildebeest look like? Can someone send in us your a online? picture of a wildebeest? Please, somebody. But like a picture you took. Do, do people take pictures of wildebeest? Oh, I feel like sure they're they like one of those animals that exist, but we don't really know they exist. <laughs> they're like a mythical... <laughs> can we get David Attenborough on the <laughs> To be like, we definitely know that they exist. And they have existed for many years. I know. Yeah. I would absolutely. My life would be complete if David Attenborough ever came on our podcast. I mean, I love him to bits. I you think there is no bit. one better on TV no, than David just... Attenborough. There's David Attenborough, then there's Sir Trevor McDonald, then there's Michael Caine, and it doesn't really get wow. much better than that. I would love. David Attenborough could read me bedtime stories forever. It'd be the greatest thing. Just the lovely voice. Hot. No, oh. I just love his voice. I could fall asleep to that voice. Good night. Anyway, I feel like we should write to him and say, please come on our podcast and talk about World Beast. I think you might need to do image as well as sound for David Attenborough. Yeah. Boom. Really lovely uh, tasting with you. Thank you so much, Tor, for bringing four wines that neither of us, well, I knew two of them very briefly, but actually really nice to sort of delve into them for both of us, I yes. think, Gwen. We'll definitely be exploring South Africa a little bit more. One day we will make it there together. Yes, it would be lovely. I have never been. I'd yeah. love to visit. For those people who want to find these wines, Germany, I don't think they're being distributed, at least to my knowledge at the moment. But in, sorry, guys. So the UK... So Wine Rooms has them. Carte Blanche Wines distributes them to the trade. Any wine shops? And uh, the Good Wine Shop has okay, them. Great. Okay, great. Um, the, the quality... Wine shop, Gus has them. Huh? Great. So they're available in a few in a few places. And will we be expecting more interesting South African cut stuff coming from you? Listen, I'm I can wax lyrical about some of the other areas because I think the the Swarton virus has spread to a new generation in Stellenbosch in the southern regions. So, so we'll have to meet up again and try some more South African so stuff with you. We might have to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So for those of you, uh, we'll, we'll post links and we'll tag in all yes. the winemakers and where to find the wines in the UK, of course. But obviously go down and visit Tor and his crew at all of the wine rooms that you can find. <laughs> yeah. Or if you're in Liverpool, Bobby at Bunch Wine Bar in Liverpool. Oh, really? okay, great. Oh, I've got lots of clients in Liverpool. Yeah. Send them your way. Send them way. Very fun. Um, but for those of you that want to stay in touch with us and stay tuned to all of our news, you can find us on Instagram at Juice dot podcast and you can find us at twitter at juice underscore podcast and on the website at juice dot show where you can also find a link to email us and we really would love to see your wine bottles your what you're drinking what you're eating for lunch what you're whatever show us your sessions thank you again Thor, for visiting us again thank I you know. two times we're yeah, very privileged to have your company i mean you know how to treat the ladies right you brought us four bottles so i think <laughs> it's definitely gonna have to be we'll six have bottles next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so emily until next week thank you gwen and thank, thank you. you thank you for talk. thank good. you cheers guys cheers cheers, cheers to sa cool cheers to you guys